You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 13, The Short Order Cook Syndrome and How to Beat It. Do you suffer from the short order cook syndrome? Do you make more than one meal at night to accommodate the varying preferences of your family? A backup meal or an alternate dish whenever your child won't eat or refuses to eat what's on your table? If this sounds like you, you may have fallen into the short order cook syndrome. Listen in for tips and strategies to beat it without losing your time, patience, and sanity. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey there, everyone. Jill here, and welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast. If this is your first time here, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and childhood nutrition expert. I've spent my career focused on children of all ages, birth to age 18, in fact, and the special concerns that surround nourishing them, feeding them, and all the food and feeding challenges that inevitably crop up over an 18-year childhood. I've worked in hospitals and have owned my own private practice. As a blogger, I've spent the last seven years writing about childhood nutrition, and most recently, I've embarked on this podcast. My goals for the Nourish Child podcast are to cover current issues around childhood nutrition, help you navigate feeding your child, and educate you about the latest research and treatment approaches when dealing with your child's eating, your own job of feeding, and the usual hurdles that come with growing a healthy child. Today's show notes can be found at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 013. That's 013 for episode 13. So I'm getting ready to head to the Food and Nutrition Conference and Expo, which is taking place in Boston. We nutrition professionals call that FENCI as an abbreviated acronym. And while I'm there, I'm going to be giving a talk with Melanie Potok, who is a speech and language therapist who specializes in feeding. And together, we are going to be talking about ARFID, A-R-F-I-D, which is an acronym for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, or what many of us sort of lump into the definition of extreme picky eating. The goal of our talk is to really help other nutrition professionals, many of which who will be dietitians, understand our fit and how it differs from typical picky eating and what we collectively can do from a nutrition standpoint uh, to help these kiddos move along with their eating. And of course, as a, as a side dish to that, uh, optimizing their growth and their development. Melanie will address the uh, feeding techniques and aspects of treating these kids, and I will address the nutrition aspects. The overall goal, though, is to bring a greater le- level of knowledge and some more confidence to nutrition professionals so that they can feel comfortable taking on these clients in their smaller clinic settings or their private practice or if they're working with a physician and help them create their own system and their own strategies and really their own collaborative team of experts to help these kids. Because when families are seeking help for their children who might have ARFID or extreme picky eating, it's really hard to find appropriate nutrition professionals that know how to treat these kids. And there's a delicate balance of, of moving them along, treating their underlying contributing issues, but helping them move along with food and eating without it being a negative experience and it not causing more harm or more damage to their already limited abilities to eat. On another note, there was a New York Times article that came out this week on picky eating, so it's sort of been the theme of my week. Anyways, this article did a really nice review about 
picky eating, what it is, and they made the point that, you know, not all picky eaters are underweight, which is true. Some picky eaters are overweight, and that's related to the types of foods that they're eating. And the article also covered basically what to do with a picky eater to help them overcome and how to interact with them as a parent and what not to do. So it was a pretty good comprehensive article. However, I felt that it was missing uh, a couple of components, which I talked about on my Facebook page, Just the Right Bite, but I wanted to sort of explore that a little bit here before we dig into our topic. The first part that I thought was missed was this advice oftentimes uh, healthcare professionals will give parents of picky eaters, and that is that the child will eventually eat. Just give them time, and they will eat if they're hungry. Well, kids with extreme picky eating or with ARFID oftentimes won't eat. They, they are the kids that will sit at the table and refuse to eat. And eating is such a negative thing for them that they can overcome their hunger. It doesn't bother them to pass on food. So I felt the article missed that point because there is quite a section of, of kids who are picky eaters that have no problem not eating. And those kids obviously can get into some trouble nutritionally, hydration-wise, growth-wise. And so that information sometimes can contribute to the problem as opposed to contributing to the resolution of that problem. And then the other point was that the article did not really talk about the interaction of the parents and the child together around food and eating, or what I like to call the feeding dynamic. I believe that the feeding dyna dynamic always plays into picky eating. Always, always, always. I haven't treated a family yet where I haven't had to, you know, dig into the positive feeding versus negative feeding and the implications of both. So when I talk about negative feeding, I kind of covered this in episode number three when I talked about your feeding style. But the feeding practices that can be negative to a child who is a picky eater are things like pressure, nagging, pleading them to take another bite, begging them to finish their plate, bribing them with sweets or treats or more TV time or play time, or even sadly punishing them for not eating. None of these really seem to work with the picky eaters, particularly if they're extreme in their picky eating. So uh, the article didn't really touch on that, but I think it's a really important component to address if you are a parent of a picky eater or a nutrition professional working with a picky eater. I think it's um, essential that the feeding dynamic and positive feeding strategies are addressed. Next week on the Nourish Child podcast, I encourage you to listen in. I'll be interviewing Sally Kuzemchek from Real Mom Nutrition, and we will be talking about her perspective on feeding kids, but especially her perspective on snacking. So be sure to tune in for that. I think you'll really, really enjoy it. Okay, let's dig into the short order cook syndrome. So what exactly is a short order cook? Well, I did a quick Google search to see what would come up. And of course, it is a profession. <laughs> the short order cook is an official recognized uh, profession that you can get hired for and paid for doing. And by definition, I found one that says it's a cook who specializes in preparing simple dishes that can be made very quickly. These types of cooks work in places like diners and fast food establishments. Well, 
you might be chuckling a little bit. If you consider yourself a short order cook, what does that look like in the home? And what am I referring to when I say the short order cook syndrome? Well, in the home, to me anyways, it means that you're making a backup meal for your child or you're making what your child will eat rather than challenging him with new foods. You also may keep your child's preferred foods handy just in case you need them as a backup. And you might be afraid of your child not eating at mealtime. And that might be because uh, maybe your child is thin or underweight or maybe your child doesn't eat all the different food groups and that makes you worried or maybe your child just doesn't have a very healthy diet overall. So those fears can underlie why you might be a short order cook. You also could be a short order cook if you're allowing a hefty snack after dinner when it's not eaten. So it kind of goes like this or some variation of it. You make a meal of let's say spaghetti and meatballs. Your child refuses to eat it and instead he just wants the pasta part. No sauce, no meatballs. So then you worry that there's no protein in the meal. You ask your child what he would like to eat instead. He or she says chicken nuggets. So you make chicken nuggets. Now, let's acknowledge that you're feeling a little frustrated here because you spent a lot of time making meatballs and putting this nice meal together. And maybe you're a little bit angry at yourself because you knew this would happen and why didn't you just go ahead and make the chicken nuggets in the first place? You go ahead and make the chicken nuggets. So your child eats the plain pasta and the chicken nuggets while the rest of the family eats your spaghetti and meatball dinner. So this is catering or short order cooking. It's fairly common at the family meal table around the country. In fact, one survey found that about 80% of parents with picky eaters feel that they have little control over their child's food choices and their eating. And 75% of parents give in to their picky eaters' requests for food. That's a lot of caving in, parents. So of course, it all boils down to patterns. If you're frequently short order cooking, you've probably got the syndrome. If it's a rare occasion and it doesn't happen very often, then you might just want to check in with yourself and take steps to make sure it doesn't become a syndrome and that you understand the ups and downs and the pros and negatives of what it's all about. Okay, so why do we cater to our child's food demands? Why do we become short order cooks? Well, I think it's because catering to a child's food demands is the path of least resistance. So let's think about that. When you cater, there are a lot of things that you could be avoiding. There are a lot of problems that you could be solving. Number one, you could be avoiding a meltdown. So it's no fun that your child melts down at dinner. In fact, a lot of us would say that a meltdown at dinner pretty much ruins dinner. So catering in, might help you avoid that meltdown. It also might help you avoid a guilty complex that goes with drawing a line in the sand on food or just saying no. After all, you don't want to be too strict or too controlling, right? Catering can also be motivated by wanting to please everyone in the family or keep the peace because after all, isn't the meal table supposed to be a happy place? It might also be motivated by wanting to ensure your child leaves the table with a full belly. In other words, you want your child to have a meal that he walks away from and feels happy and satisfied with, and you also inherently know that that probably will translate to no panhandling for snacks later on. You also might be trying to avoid the late-night munchies. So catering can help you 
avoid a crying child who is hungry in the middle of the night. That is like the worst thing to get up in the middle of the night and have to feed a child. So catering can really be your way of taking the path of least resistance or avoiding so many of these things that make feeding your child uh, not very enjoyable. But here's what I know. The more you aim to please your child with food, the less pleased and even more demanding your child may be. So catering makes it harder to feed your child and your family, which, let's face it, can make you feel unhappy. Okay, there are some short-term and long-term consequences to becoming a short-order cook, and I want to just briefly review those before we dig into what you can do to rehab yourself, rehabilitate yourself from being a short-order cook. So some of the short-term consequences are, number one, your authority is undermined, uh, you short-change nutrition, and three, potentially you end up having a frustrated relationship with your child or your family. So let's go over those. So number one, your authority is undermined. So you're supposed to call the shots on food in the home, meaning what you serve or what is put on the menu for each meal and snack, when they are served, so that means the timing, and where your meals are served. So that's the dinner table or the kitchen counter. Remember, that is the division of responsibility, and Ellen Satter uh, coined the division of responsibility, and it's basically the uh, job that you have as a feeder and the job that your child has as an eater. You're in charge of the what, when, and where of mealtimes, and your child is in charge of whether he will eat what you serve him and how much he will eat. One of the short-term consequences is that you undermine that division of responsibility and it actually puts your, your child in charge rather than you in charge when you cater to your child's food requests. So that division of responsibility gets disturbed and when you're a child assumes the role of determining what he will eat rather than you, the feeding and the dynamic around it can get really off track. Number two, you shortchange nutrition when you cater or you, when you're a short order cook. So catering, we know from the literature, can lead to repetitive meals, or in other words, when you cater to your child's favorite accepted foods, you may be narrowing his or her food variety. So he or she is getting the same food over and over and over again. So not that big wide variety that we're all trying to accomplish with feeding our children. And remember, food variety is that safeguard for adequate nutrition. The more variety in your child's diet, the more overall nutrients your child receives. So if you are catering to your child or short order cooking, food variety and nutrients can suffer. And then the third short-term consequence is that you end up having a frustrated relationship. When you think about it, even though family discord and drama might be placated for the time being at the meal table, you yourself, the short order cook, may be left feeling frustrated, overworked, and underappreciated. So let's face it, it is a lot of work to prepare a meal for your family and to then on top of that make an additional dish is more effort, time, and an inconvenience for you. So in the end, it's too much work and it also sends a wrong message and it shortcuts nutrition. So those are sort of the summary. That's a summary of the short-term consequences of of becoming a short order cook. So what are the long-term consequences? Well, the long-term consequences, the biggest one is, or the biggest two rather, are that you encourage picky eating with short order cooking and 
your child's health may suffer. So let's get into that a little bit. So what do I mean when you encourage picky eating? When you cater to your child's food requests or demands on a regular basis, it encourages picky eating. This was covered in a 2009 study in the International Journal of Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity. Again, it boils down to that narrowed food variety, that short list of foods that your child will eat. When you only give your child those foods, you fail to help him branch out to a wider variety of different foods in his diet. And because of that, that narrow list, your child may also miss out on nutritious foods like fruits and vegetables and dairy products. Being a short order cook can actually give life and longevity to picky eating. That's an eye opener for parents who are really trying to help their kids get through the picky eating phase. If you're short order cooking and catering to the preferences, you're really short changing uh, your child's ability to expand and, and blossom with new foods. So you're giving life to picky eating and may even be contributing to it lasting for a longer period of time. Another long-term consequence, which I mentioned before, is that your child's health may suffer. So remember, the longer picky eating lasts, the higher the risk for poor nutrition and maybe even inadequate weight gain and growth or problems with your child's weight. If his diet choices, if his short list of food choices are nutrient poor but high in calories. And your child might even have some social challenges related to being a picky eater or being underweight or being overweight. So the weight aspect, underweight is the obvious. Most of us and even healthcare professionals oftentimes just automatically think that a child who's a picky eater, who's just not eating a wide variety of food, is going to automatically be underweight. But that's not the case in today's world. We see normal weight uh, children who are picky eaters. We see underweight and we see overweight. So we see all three weight categories. And while your child's weight status should not be the motivator for, it should not be the primary motivator for whether you try to rehabilitate your short order cook syndrome or not, it is something that does play into the overall picture of how catering to your child's food preferences can influence his overall health. So let's talk about what you can do instead. But before we really dig into the specifics, I just want to mention that I don't want you to expect overnight success. If you have the short order cook syndrome and you have been catering to your child's food preferences, you've probably been doing this for a while and your child has gotten used to this way of life. So when you start to make changes, you may see some resistance, like real re resistance from your child. You may see sadness. You may see anger. You might see defiance. But it's okay. Think of it this way. You're asking your child to stretch, to take a grown-up step in his maturity around food and eating. And in a way, you're wiping away his control and the comfort he has grown to love. But be patient, be loving, be kind, be firm, and be on a mission. So now I'd like to talk about some different ways that you can overcome the short order cook syndrome, or in other words, eight ways to rehab the short order cook syndrome. So number one is to offer safe food. So this is including, this means including one or two foods you know your child can handle. Safe foods are familiar, they're liked, and oftentimes they might be milk, fruit, cheese, bread, butter, those types of foods that are easy to include in your child's diet. You want to include one or two of those foods when you're planning out your meals. The goal is to make sure there is something on your table you know your child will eat. But 
you don't want to have everything on the table catered to what your child will eat. So you're going to go ahead and make that spaghetti and meatball dinner, but you might include a bowl of fruit you know your child loves and a gallon of milk on the table and maybe some bread and butter. Number two, Nick's plan B. So no more backup rescue meals, no more hefty snacks one hour after dinner is over. You're done with that, period. And it's okay to let your child know that you're a new gal, that you are going about feeding the family in a new way. Close that kitchen. Not literally, because I know so many Americans today have an open kitchen floor plan, and there aren't doors where you can really close down the kitchen, but figuratively, close the kitchen. When the meal is over, it's over. There's no food until the next scheduled meal or snack. It's really as easy as that. And I should probably also mention that when you close the kitchen and you shut down food for two or three hours until the next snack or the next meal, your child will survive and he'll learn an important lesson. He'll learn that meals happen on a, ter- on a certain structured schedule and that's his opportunity to eat. And beyond that, there isn't a rescue backup meal for him to rely on. So he'll, un- he'll eventually learn that it's time to eat when it's time to eat. Try family style meals. If you don't know what those are, they basically take the meal components and place them on the table and allow the family members to pass around those those meal items so that each person can help themselves pick the food that they want to eat and pick the amount that they want to eat it in. So basically, family-style meals allow your child to pick and choose what and how much he wants to eat from the foods you've set out for the meal. Again, one or two of those items are going to be something you know your child will eat. Try to include a serving from each food group so there's a wide variety of options on the table. And here's the upside. The more you let your child pick and choose from the options you set out, the more likely your child will be able to find something to eat. Number four, do meals the dinner bar way. So I call the dinner bar a way of serving children entrees where you basically deconstruct the entree and let your child assemble the ingredients to make his own entree in the manner in which he likes to eat it. So take again that spaghetti and meatball example. Rather than putting a big dish on the table that has the pasta on the bottom with the sauce layered on top and the meatballs poised around the bowl on top of the sauce, you would deconstruct that. So you would separate the pasta from the sauce and from the meatballs and allow your children to pile up that food the way he sees fit. So for example, in my house, One of my kids would put it all together, put the pasta, then the sauce, and the meatballs on top. Another of my children might put the pasta plain on the plate, have no sauce, and then put the meatballs right next to the pasta. The dinner bar works well for combination dishes such as pasta, pizza, tacos, and salads because they allow your child to assemble the entree themselves. Combination foods can be really tough for children, and they can be those dishes that send a picky child running the other way. They're very complicated, and they're not easy for kids to identify what's in there. So when you deconstruct the entree, you may find you get more cooperation with the meal. And remember, kids do tend to eat better when they assemble their entree because they are more invested in their creation. I'll include a link at the end of the show notes on closing the kitchen and on the dinner bar series. I have several dinner bar ideas in the archives of my blog, and I'll include that link for you there. The next is to make sure when you're planning meals to offer the basics. You know the important food groups, protein, grains, fruit, vegetables, dairy, or a non-dairy substitute, and healthy fats. The more food groups you can offer at mealtimes, the better. Try to hit all of them, especially at dinner when appetite can be really variable. Remember, little kids can have a very little appetite at the end of the day due to other meals and snacks they've eaten earlier in the day, and the older child might be carrying a bigger appetite 
due to a growth spurt or playing sports. So the bottom line is, remember that the more food groups on the table means that you have a better shot at meeting your child's overall nutrient needs. The sixth way that you can rehab your short order cook syndrome is to double up on nutritious foods, especially the ones that your child likes. So for example, if you've got a fruit lover, offer two types of fruit at meals, such as strawberries and clementines. If you've got a starch lover, go ahead and offer peas and pasta or corn and whole grain rolls. Don't panic about missing veggies or too many starchy foods. You can still pack nutrition into the meal. And remember to take a step back and look at the whole day and the different foods that your child's eaten across the day. And even take a step further back and look at what your child's been getting all week. It's likely you've probably hit on all those food groups and have done a really good job of of spreading out variety throughout the week. Number seven, keep it simple. I want you to lose the idea that you have to make gourmet meals for your kids, especially if your child is picky. That can be a real barrier to moving forward. Remember, kids like food to be recognizable, identifiable, and yummy. So for vegetables, for example, a lot of families get hung up on vegetables. Serve them raw with an easy side dip. That will do the trick for a lot of kids. Many kids are perfectly happy to see a meal with slices of bread or a bowl of unadulterated fruit. So I want you to shift your mindset. While we love gourmet meals as adults ourselves, they can be overwhelming and intimidating for a child. Kids prefer less complicated food over the food they are not able to identify or that might be foreign or new to them. And last, tip number eight, employ your child. Older children can peel a banana or an orange. Young kids can pop off the tops of strawberries or separate orange sections. Get your child in the kitchen cooking with your supervision. Obviously, you need to support and challenge your child as needed, but periodically ask him or her to do some of the work at the meal table. Not only will you be teaching independence, you'll be teaching food skills at the same time. Remember, kids are happy to pitch in and take over easy food prep and eating tasks. Okay, let's wrap this up. There are three things I just want to remind you of as you're thinking about overcoming this short order cook syndrome. Number one, if you've fallen into the short order cook syndrome, all is not lost. You can rehabilitate your tendencies. And if you can't do all eight of those things, pick one or two items to work on and just gradually chip away at your tendencies and try to improve them. Number two, There may be times you catch yourself being a short order cook, but that's okay. As long as it's not your go-to method for feeding your child, you will be fine. Use your parenting instinct to determine what is needed for the situation at hand. Maybe it will make sense to short order cook in that moment. The point is, don't get too reliant on this method of feeding your child, because in the short and long run, it doesn't help you shape the healthy, tuned-in eater I know you want. And then last, take that lead in feeding and maintain your job as feeder. If you need to review your feeding style and how to interact with your child around food, go back to episode number three where I talk about feeding styles. That will help you. Okay, friends, that's a wrap. Don't forget to head over and get the show notes at jillcastle.com forward slash 013. That's 013 for episode number 13. I will have the links and resources related to this show for you there. Of interest to you, I'll be including a link with a free download embedded called Overcome the Short Order Cook Syndrome. It's just a cheat sheet of the actions that you can take to beat the short order cook syndrome and that I've reviewed here in this episode. 
If you enjoyed today's episode, there are a few things you can do to help the Nourish Child podcast grow. Write a review on iTunes, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Android, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Tuned In, and more. Or share the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, wherever you hang out. Let your peers know about the Nourish Child podcast. The more parents that know about the show, the more informed and better at nourishing their child they will be. As always, grab that child in your life, give them a big squeeze, and I'll see you next week. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out. 